since we have to get started somewhere. I think for me, Prelude Records has always been synonymous with Patrick Adams. Because he's the first producer that I worked with when I started doing all sorts of remixes there and stuff. And I was always so completely amazed by the genius of this person. He was just like all around. You'd see the guy go in the studio and he could engineer, he could play the instruments, he could arrange. He just liked the whole thing. And let me tell you, when you get started looking at somebody like that, it kind of puts you in your place. <laughs> Big up to you, Patrick Adams. You keep inspiring everyone around.
Since certain people ask about it, just want to make sure we're clear. This is not a study course. You will not be graded. There's no homework to turn in. We're just chilling and like celebrating all the good stuff that released themselves on Prelude over the years. So there's no chronological order. There's no like fine explanation threads or anything i'm just playing music as it comes some of it very well known some of it probably a lot more obscure but one thing it all has in common it all came from the prelude catalog all right Strike it back, that's where it's at. 
So the first thing I think is really important to notice about a lot of the Prelude Records material is people always think of the big hits, you know, the real up-tempo ones. But actually, what distinguished a lot of the Prelude releases was that they really signed a lot of boogie records. Like this one, which is by the Strikers. Or the Gunchback Boogie Band, or Next Movement, or it goes on and on and on. But I actually am particularly fond of these mid-tempo, sort of in-between, funky disco records that are still sort of slinking along but they still have enough energy to be played in the clubs so that was something that I think was pretty distinctive about the Prelude sound that people might tend to forget a bit Oh, 
Hey Francois, I hope you're well. You asked me to choose my favourite record on Prelude, which I thought, that's pretty difficult because there's so many records on Prelude, which I think are amazing records. And I think of those labels, South Soul, West End, Prelude, I think Prelude is my favourite and has the most, I think was the, had the highest hit rate for me. And um, if I was going to choose one record, it's very, very difficult. And um, this isn't really my favourite. It's just a record I love on Prelude is You Got What It Takes by Bobby Thurston. I think, firstly, I, I really respect the producers, Willie Lester and Rodney Brown. They did some amazing stuff for Bobby Thurston, but also for Gail Adams and, of course, Sharon Red. And they got a really great, organic, fat sound. I love the sound on their records, really solid sounding, great playing. And I, I, I like what they often used to do on their tracks on the long versions is go into some jazzy guitar and keyboards at the end to so kind of go somewhere else, which is something which I, I, I really enjoy in a record. I, I like it to go somewhere at the end. And um, it's just a record I've never got fed up with hearing it. Something I bought right back at the beginning of my love affair with dance music when as a new release on Epic, uh, UK Epic. I think I've got, here's the uh, American album here. Um, but yeah, and I've never got fed up with it. I still love it. I, st I particularly like the guitar riff and um, it's just a great record. So uh, Bobby Thurston, You Got What It Takes is my favourite song on Prelude.
funky bass. One of the trademarks of that Willie Lester and Rodney Brown production sound. Well, there's one thing for sure. It was really great working for Prelude Records, having all these hits after hits after hits. Let me tell you, I never had a problem going and to parties or getting into clubs. having a couple of really cool upcoming releases of acetates in my bag kind of guaranteed that no matter where I wanted to go and have a party I'd somehow be invited by whoever the DJ was
to add something else to this. It's that for a lot of people, by 1979, they kind of felt like disco was over with and done for and yesterday's news. I mean, maybe in the sense of the village people and Ethel Merman and Disco Duck, it probably was done. But 1979 is exactly when Prelude started pushing through and got an incredible string of hit after hit after hit that completely not just took the clubs by storm, but were getting all over the radio stations all across the U.S. and then the rest of the world so if you look at it actually what's really significant about prelude is that they actually managed to find the right wedge the right moment to prop themselves on that stage and it literally exploded and I gotta say it was pretty amazing for me to be working there and have a hand at going into the studio to mix so many of their tracks. I really wish I could find adequate, proper words to describe the excitement that this generated, some of this music that we were releasing. It was just like so amazing. And to go to the garage or to go all these other big clubs like Bonds or even Studio 54 and no matter where we went we'd always hear the prelude stuff getting played at peak time that was really something else and then you'd go out and you hear Frankie Cocker playing it on the radio you know Thank you. 
power and the sheer elegance of unlimited touch. Rest in peace, Sandy Anderson, who sadly left us sometime last year, who was a cornerstone of the band as the bass player, but the rest of the group carries on, and I know Lenny Underwood and the rest of them are all busy. More on this in a bit. favorite prelude record of all time is by Hubert Eves III and James D. Train Williams, known as D. Train. And the song, Keep On. Nine minutes of gorgeous, psychedelic, dubby, soulful space funk mixed by none other than Francois Kevorkian, also known as Francois K. You may have heard of him. One of my favorite producers of all time. And it sounds amazing on the Loft sound system. And it's a true Loft classic, not only because of the sonics, but also because of the lyrics. The words are like earth, wind, and fire words. I mean, life has many ups and downs. Plant your feet on solid ground. Incredible words for right now. <laughs> life is, certainly does have its ups and downs, as we've noticed in the past year. And with the strength of your mind, you can be set free. I mean, those are just great words when you're self-isolating and just letting your mind take you away. And keep on. It's all about persevering. Because someday, hopefully soon, we'll be dancing together underneath the great mirror ball. We just need to keep on. Cosmo Murphy for the heartfelt, heartfelt words about one of the most important songs that really came out of Clubland. And the reason for that is because it really was a spiritual anthem. It was the perfect match of an amazing composition 
stellar production, absolutely mesmerizing vocal delivery, married to one of the truly, truly great songs. I would say just like Stevie Wonder, those are things that inspire you for the rest of your life. And James Williams and Hubert Eves most certainly delivered with this. And really, even though I don't like to do too many of those back in the day memories, I'm hard pressed. to recall a song that had such a powerful effect on people in a positive way of course so big up to you James Williams and Hubert Eves 3 and the rest of the crew like Howard King on drums and Tree on guitar and whoever else helped out. This truly was something historical. There was something that I remember very specifically happening, like at the garage. I actually had seen some Richard Simmons exercise video signs of all these hands that say reach. I went around and collected a bunch of them and we pasted them in the corridor between the kitchen and the dance floor and it was just so obvious that it was about reach reach I don't know such an amazing time I really wish I could show you what it was like to be right there at the garage seeing 2,000 people singing every piece of the lyrics of this song just like if their life depended on it truly a cleansing of the soul I can't find any other words to describe it. It was so powerful and it brought everybody together in such an incredible way. I don't know that many songs that have that power. Like this one does. This part right here, reach, reach, reach.
So a little anecdote. We mix this one. That is Hubert Eves 3 and myself at Counterpoint Studios. The engineer on the session was so inept, we just sent him home. We just asked him to like patch a couple of things and then we worked on our own. And uh, we did the whole mix in 12 hours. And it was just magic. There's no other way of describing it. It just came together so naturally. And even though things were pretty low tech, we didn't use a lot of fancy effects or a lot of very elaborate schemes because neither Hubert nor I were really professional skilled engineers we kind of worked with the vibe and you know the result speaks for itself 12 hours nice
And on the topic of working at places that didn't have proper engineers, there was this other studio I used to be working at a lot called ERAS Studio, E-R-A-S. That was the province of a very famous producer named Boris Midney, who was kind of noted for doing all these incredible Euro disco things like USA European Connection and all that. Anyway, Boris Midney's studio was pretty technologically advanced. But for whatever reason, the staff that he had there were really kind of traditional and we got, Prelude got a really good deal for me to work there. So they would send me to do my mixes at that studio, Eras. And that was, again, the case of the engineers not really understanding what I was trying to accomplish. So half the time I would just throw them out of the room and figured I'd do better on my own without them slowing me down because I could at least figure out what it is I was trying to accomplish. So this was one such session. Typically, I would go in like somewhere around noon and then I'd be finished the next day by uh, yeah, a 24-hour session. And... You know, that's sort of interesting because in a way, instead of depending on all these other people like I was doing at other studios like at Sigma or Right Track or wherever else I'd be working, I was just on my own, so I really had to make sure everything was kind of doing what it was supposed to do. But unless there was a technical issue, there was nothing really slowing me down could just do whatever the hell I wanted and nobody was going to tell me it was crazy or wrong or I should do it the other way and this is one such mix I guess it's pretty primitive if you really look at you know compared to like Steely Dan or something like that but it works it actually really works great production by Eric Matthews of course and Stella Vocal performance by Sharon Red. What else do you want? Between the Sharon Red record and this one, which is called On a Journey by Electric Funk, you could pretty much argue that this was already kind of a template for house music that only came a couple of years later out of Chicago. I've already done a program about that if you want to check it out. It's called The Roots of House on my YouTube channel. Anyway, it was quite exciting to see how fast things were evolving 
because obviously these records were done with sequencers and drum machines. And yeah, by 1982, 83, that stuff was in full effect. Double Journey, a long, winding, beautiful proto house, proto deep house jam. Um, this actually, um, I don't know, it reminds me of The Loft. It, uh, it's so joyous, it's so um, energetic, um, it's super long but doesn't ever drop in energy. It kind of keeps, for me, it just, it's rolling and it keeps picking up steam. Um, you can really play it at any, it, it's a, it's, has a soft touch, so I think it works um, a lot of different at a lot of different points in the night. Um, and one thing that is not unique to Prelude, I don't think, but um, but it's always so, something I'm uh, I enjoy looking for. Um, this was engineered by um, Herb Powers, and he um, he writes kind of creative things sometimes in the runout grooves and. Um, while this isn't credited on the label with Francois's name, um, he does have uh, FK with a smiley face on one side and Francois K with a smiley face on the other side. And I love these breadcrumbs that he leaves for us um, and for kind of um, uh, music nerds like us. It's really interesting to, to read these grooves and, and find out more about the record. So um, I'm happy to have it. I'm happy to play it. I'm happy to hear it. Um, and we're happy to be here today with you. Thanks, Francois. Obviously, a single journey was not enough. So I took the cue, and thank you, Paul Raphael, for hinting that perhaps we should make that a double journey. So 
So I have a really cool story that has never quite left my mind about this. So I was at a record store called Downstairs Records, which was in the subway stairs on uh, West 42nd Street and 6th Avenue. And my very good friend, Yvonne Turner, was working there, and she was there behind the counter, along with Cynthia Cherry. And so, you know, it's like a Thursday, I think, or something, and T. Scott and myself, both T. Scott and I are right at the counter asking Yvonne, well, what's going on, and what's up, what's new, and she... She had two significant records that week. The first record was something called Love Money by the TW Funk Masters. And I couldn't quite tell on the store stereo, but the bass was so heavy on that. Speaker Destroyer bass. And the other record was this. But there was only one copy. And both T and I are going like, wow, this is so great. And T goes, look, Francois, I know you're playing at the garage this weekend because Larry's away and you're going to have a big show. And, you know, I was doing T a lot of favors by playing for him at Better Days when he was in the studio. So he was a real gentleman about it. And he said, well, let Francois have the copy and I'll get it later. And, of course the record got such an incredible reaction when I played it at the garage it was just like everyone was mesmerized by this track which originates out of elite records in the UK a gentleman named Andy Soika who I I actually was so impressed with this that I told Prelude that we should license it And uh, so we called them and they agreed to the license and then this was out on Prelude Records and we did sort of okay. I mean, we only sold 20,000 copies. I know, everybody's laughing, right? In those days, selling 20,000 copies for Prelude meant we're not even going to sign it again. It's just a waste of time. Don't ask me. But the thing is, over the years as a DJ, this is really a record that I kept coming back to much later, even after Prelude closed. I would still be playing it, and Dave Mancuso was playing it heavily at the loft. All the people that were into this sort of spiritual sound were really all over this track. So... Actually, I had become very good friends with the producer, Andy Soika. And I decided to uh, release it again on my own label, on Wave Classics. But this time, I actually decided to make a deal with him and purchase the master. So, look for remixes of this at some point that I'm going to be putting out. This is such a timeless piece, I really felt that it deserves more love than just be relegated to, uh, oh yeah, cool jazz funk record from the 80s. And to this day though, it still remains something that people consider a staple of the Prelude catalog. And at least in my case, one of the few A&R signings that I did, which I felt were really significant and I think history has sort of validated those choices.
not letting you go and get away with a single journey here. You're going to get treated to the full double journey experience. This part, for some reason, whenever I hear this sweet sort of tinkly piano chord, it always reminds me of David Mancuso. There's something so graceful and delicate the way David would play the music. And I think the dancers at the loft would always pick up on that and they start twirling and doing all these acrobatics and all that. And this sort of motion. That was kind of mesmerizing in a way. And there are not that many records that I feel do that so beautifully as this one does. This effortless sort of water flowing down a mountain or cascades or very very poetic instrumental Hi, Danny Krivit here. Um, Prelude Tribute. Uh, Francois K. mixed most of the records that I really liked on Prelude. And uh, so he, he's the right guy for this. Um, the first was um, In the Bush by Musique, which was a huge international disco hit. But before that, it was just a really hot jam. And... Francois had brought it to Lago Van at uh, Paradise Garage before anyone. And um, Larry had it for months, uh, you know, before it was out. And it became a huge garage anthem. Uh, if I wanted to hear it, I had to go to the garage, which I did. And um, even though it became this big, uh, popular hit, um, I just always think of it as a garage classic. Thank you. 
So as it were, this particular track was the first time I ever went into the studio. I had just started working for Prelude two weeks before that. And immediately they said, you got to go in the studio and do stuff for us. And I was like, yes, sir. Uh, was I ready for this? I, I'm not sure that I was, but I did my best. And did I like it? Yes, a lot. Now, the session took place at Blank Tape Studio where Bob Blank was the engineer because he was working with Patrick Adams on most of his projects and stuff. And I think we knocked this one out in 12 hours or something. But I had a lot, a lot, a lot of editing to do later because I took reels and reels and reels of takes with me and kept playing with the different percussion breaks and parts. But all in all, it was a really a pretty amazing send-off because as soon as I submitted the mix and I went and mastered it and I started taking it around as Danny said I, I went to the garage with the acetate of my mix and it just completely lit, set the place in fire it, it really was like a hot record unquestionably and uh, even though it's never been made public, I'm led to believe that it sold well in excess of a million copies. We'll actually never know that, but it doesn't really matter. I think the important part is this truly was a phenomenon. And I assume that for Patrick Adams, this is what opened the door for him to work with all these other artists like Inner Life and whoever else Rick James he worked for Speaking of uh, successful producers, this was a different project that was more on the Euro Disco side of things. And it was brought to Prelude by Freddie Petrus, who happened to also be the same person who produced Change, you know? But he was doing this in Italy, and a lot of the stuff they were producing over there had that real sort of relentless, pounding, high-energy sound. This one is called I'm a Man by Macho. And this also did really, really well in clubs, by the way, but not the same kind of clubs. I mean, you wouldn't hear this getting played at the garage or Better Days or the loft. You'd hear it being played at the Saint, at 12 West, at Studio 54, or the Xenon, the more commercial type of clubs, you know?
This is actually the part that a lot of DJs would start the record with. It had a nice rush to it, nice build up. Another thing that this particular record was very significant for is that it was part of a trend where producers would deliver to labels epic sort of odyssey length records. This one is 17 minutes, this song. It was great for DJs who could go to the bathroom and do whatever and mingle with friends and still get back to the booth in time to put the next song on. There were a lot of songs like that. They were like sort of cruise control, autopilot. Like Love and Kisses, you know, or Saron, Love and C Minor, or these kinds of things.
This one is a bit of a forgotten gem. It's produced by the crack team of Moses Dillard and Jesse Boyce out of Nashville, Tennessee. Vocalist is Miss Lorraine Johnson. And on the remix duties, we have early disco hero Raphael Charis, very ably assisted by engineer Bob Blank, who seems to have his hands on so many of those early records. Now, for those of you who might try to buy this on vinyl, it's a little bit of a funny story because this was only ever shipped out as a promo. So, this might account for the fact that when you go and try to find it on Discogs, I'm not talking about the bootleg copies, I'm talking about the real OG pressing of this. We've seen it change hands for over $1,500. It's a really, really hard to get record. And it sounds so clean. I think the story was, at that time, and we're gonna get into that a little bit later, but Prelude wasn't really set up as a label that had re outreach to DJs. So whatever promo copies were made, they were shipped to the record pools and they never even had a single copy of it in the office. Trust me, I know because I looked for it in 1978 and they did not have a single one. So it's kind of a holy grail right here and probably deservedly so. I, I think it's an absolutely beautiful remake of the Teddy Pendergrass original. It really holds its own has this very raw quality about it. Love it. And for those who think they got a bargain somewhere, just remember that all the reissues of this are using the LP version, not the 12-inch that the label themselves don't know where it is, so good luck. Hey everybody, DJ Spinner here, and one of my all-time favorite prelude jams is Come Let Me Love You by Jeanette Lady Day. Funky, great for the dance floor, great for the roller skates, great tune, great arrangement, all-time favorite. Prelude, so many jams. Peace.
this was another record that I had a lot of fun mixing. Again, at Era Studio with very basic means, but the production was so excellent. And contrary to most rumors, I guarantee you that this is not the record that inspired the more cowbell meme. But to me, whenever someone mentions this record, the first thing that comes to mind is so much cowbell. That cowbell is pretty famous actually because it got sampled in one of the Crystal Waters tracks. If you pay attention and you go in that 100% Pure Love track, you will hear the cowbell. Francois, Harvey here. I'm just calling in, mate, at your request to um, mention one of my favourite records on uh, the Prelude label. And um, I think my choice will be France Jolie's I Wanna Take a Chance on Love. Um, I think it's mixed by Gino Leone. Um, yeah, absolutely wonderful record with all sorts of unusual elements, um, rhythm and synth bass with some fantastic, uh, echoed out sections. Um, yeah, give it a spin, mate. Oh yeah, DJ Harvey comes correct again. Look, no shame in admitting that even I didn't remember this one too much. But it definitely has a nice edge to it.
And as Harvey said, this was actually mixed by Gene Leone in uh, Philadelphia at Alpha Recording Studios. I also worked with him when we did the mix for Gonna Get Over You, which I'm probably going to get to at some point later in the program. It was pretty amazing. Reed and Anderson really had their finger on a certain sound. That sound to me was really important because it was the confluence of a real R&B rooted, soulful, radio friendly vibe that was also getting lots of exposure in the clubs because it was so easy to dance to and to party to. And again, I think it was pretty astute of Prelude to uh, sign these producers to uh, deliver this kind of stuff for them. This was a track that was originally on the album, the Sharon Red album, as produced by Willie Lester and Rodney Brown. And there really wasn't anything wrong with the mix on the album. It was getting played in the clubs and everything. So I was really in love with the song, but I decided that I was going to take a stab at doing a version that was different not really a total dub not a full vocal version with the verse and chorus and all that but sort of a hybrid something in between so I decided to call in Sharon Red and I, I kind of opened up some sections in the middle of the track made it very raw and basic and then I featured the guitar solo and I figured I'd ask her to do a little bit of a, like a double scat like George Benson does, you know? And she was really into that. And then I figured let her ride and go into like a whole spoken word bit which would allow me to stretch the track out without having to rely on the Can You Handle It vocals. So it's a little bit of a different approach, but I must say I was quite thrilled during this recording, the session, you know, where we actually recorded Sharon Red's vocals, went really quick. And this was done at Sigma downstairs in Studio 8, the mix room, engineered by J. Mark, you know, the same guy who mixed Love is the Message and whatever else. I mean... Stellar star engineers, one of the best studios ever. Here we go. Come on, girl, do it.
to be here. I saw you dancing all the way across the floor, talking that body talk. I can talk too. Mm -hmm. That's right. madly in love with that string section on this record so this kind of mix gave me an opportunity to really showcase that a little bit you know and now that you've got it what are you gonna do with it I've got to say I'm pretty proud of this still today it hasn't aged at all Sounds spectacular. Do you really think you can? Uh, Thank you, J Mark, no. for delivering such an amazing mix. <laughs> That's right. Uh. What's up, Francois? It's Louis Vega, Masters at Work, New Eureka and Soul. Just want to say my favorite prelude record is, happens to be one that you worked on. It's I Hear Music in the Streets by Unlimited Touch. I mean, I love it so much that I ended up re-recording it with the original Unlimited Touch band. And uh, gotta say, you did an amazing job on that record as well, Unlimited Touch. Um, it's my favorite jam, man. I, I go way back to the skating days. I used to skate to that record. I used to dance to that record. I used to go to Paradise Garage and hear that record. Larry used to kill it. And um, Francois, what can I say? Prelude, I'm so happy you're doing this. This is so important for our industry, for our culture, for you know everybody around the world to you know get it from the professor himself. Thank you so much for all the great music. It was hard for me to choose that one because I have so many favorites on Prelude. I gotta say, at least, you know, who knows, about a hundred of them. And uh, you probably made over three quarters of them. You know, you probably remixed or mixed or worked on, you know. D-Train, I mean, you name it. Uh, goodness, Jungle Rock, wow. But this one right here, I Hear Music in the Streets, that's the one.
let's be real here. When this record came out, it was like the anthem of New York. Anywhere you'd go, you'd, somehow you'd get to hear it. Whether it was on the radio or at a party or somebody playing their own little boom boxes or whatever. That song meant everything to so many of us. And for me personally, again, mixed at Era Studios. We mixed this one in like 14 hours, real quick. Bam, 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 done, you know? But this was the first time that I had really started working with Burt Reed. Burt Reed was the person who co-wrote the song and he was there for the mix with me and really helped me out with the vocals and everything because he kind of arranged the complex motion of all these chorus vocals. And I, I just, I gotta say, I fell in love with Burt Reed that day. And as a matter of fact, we started working together on a whole bunch of things. We did a little production company and we had all sorts of stuff going on. Burt Reed was a real genius. He, of course, produced so many other records that people know about, like Jamaica Girls or Dan Roy Morgan and so on. But I really think there's a piece of Burt Reed in this record, as well as the band. And it was such a beautiful marriage of talent. Yeah, I have to tell you guys, it's really, really touching. I've reached out to a number of people in the community to leave comments about what their favorite Prelude Records was. And it's been like magic. Because not a single person picked someone something that someone else had already done. I'm, I'm still I kind of completely flabbergasted by this. And I was really touched by all the outpouring of love and great stories that came out of this and as you're gonna hear more of 
sometimes things that come out that we didn't know about. But I think, for me, I'd like to um, also claim my own. After all, I'm entitled, right? I should have a favorite record. And it's okay, because no one picked it. Now, to me... This record is very special because it's really the record I identify with the arrival of dub into the style of mixing that I was doing. And it kind of changed my world around. It really did. I, I can't say how it happened, but I know it happened during this session. This dub was actually done in 30 minutes after we did the main versions. I said, oh, let me do some pieces. I want to do some crazy stuff, edits and stuff later, you know? The thing about dub is instead of playing the straight beat and the stuff just like it was made to be, it's like cubism or surrealism. You're really taking the raw material and turning it into something otherworldly and there's no limit to what your imagination can do. For those of you who may be curious, by the way, this little version is actually on the D-Train album as a reprise, but very few people pay attention to it. But for whatever reason, I actually play this more than the other versions, because I think it defines who I am.
Disclaimer, the song that Gail Adams just finished was not aimed at Luke Skywalker. No mention of lightsabers anywhere, all right? Now, this one is another true Burt Reed gem. It actually did incredibly well on sales. Not so well in the clubs in New York, but this was like a huge record all the way in the South. And this leads me to talk about the next thing that I think was truly remarkable about Prelude Records. Flashing lights, moving to the beat, 
See, it's one thing to sign great music and to go in the studio and do good versions and whatever else, but the thing about Prelude that was really special to me is that they paid particular attention to in-depth, no-nonsense radio promotion. They had this guy named Joe Kolsky. Joe Kolsky was talking like this because he lost his voice. Joe Kolsky was one of the most effective promotion people on the radio that I had ever seen in my life. He would be in the office at 8 a.m. every morning tracking radio stations across the country. And let me tell you, he got results. This is a good example of that. From what I heard, this record sold at least a quarter million copies. And it was all to do with getting the proper airplay in the southern markets all the way in the south. Everybody was on this record. For some reason, they never really managed to cross it over in the, the eastern, you know, northern part of the country like New York and Chicago, but that's the thing that was truly awesome about Prelude. Instead of just making good music, they actually had a plan on how to market it and how to bring it to people and make the connection. And I think that was absolutely incredible and they demonstrated time and time and time again that they were really great at that and in 1979 just as all the majors were left in disarray thinking that disco was dead and all, all these other indie labels were like crying the blues Prelude was going the opposite direction they were going gangbusters and they saw this as an enormous opening and this, in my opinion, is why they did so well, because they really had their shit together more than most other people did. And that doesn't have necessarily to do so much with just a good A&R and good signings and great music. It has to do with the fundamentals of running a business, which in this case meant having records pressed and delivered and manufactured on time getting it to the radio stations when they promised they would have them. And for that, we had to thank another marvelous person who's still around, by the way, working for a big label today. His name was Jerry Custer. And Jerry was the, promotion, the production manager and he was taking care of all the pressing plants and everything else. See, for things to happen like that, it's, it's not just an accident. It's not just a miracle. It took quite a lot of organization and particular kind of teamwork. We're going to get into that some more. Don't worry. Lots more stories. Every day, but my rap is good in my neighborhood, and I say it just uh, this way. I say hi ho, I'm on the go. I'm rocking to the beat in stereo, and if you wanna know just where to go, everybody just follow me. I said you listen to the band, it's called EC. That's the one that's moving your viciously, and if you listen closely, you surely find you listen to the sounds of a mastermind. Hey, hey.
Francois, comment ça va? Mon ami. This is Yvonne Turner representing Strong Enough Entertainment. Celebrating Prelude Records. A bomb label. Has so many dope hits. Including like D-Train and Unlimited Touch. Those bands were outstanding. But for me, my pick. A little bit of jazz by the Nick Striker band. That was definitely a floor filler back in the day. It had a little bit of jazz for the jazz heads. It had a little bit of funk, a little bit of electronic, a little bit of lyrics, and a whole lot of soul. I love that tune, even today. And that's my pick. Blessings, everybody. Francois, be well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Bassline 
can only be Boyd Jarvis. We miss you, Boyd. Ever since they started working for Prelude, visual definitely helped define cool sort of pre-house New York sound that I thought was really exciting and unique. For me to pick up a record, a favorite record, is probably one of the hardest questions people ever ask me because then I'm suddenly lost uh, within hundreds and hundreds of, of records to choose from. And a record from Prelude is even more difficult because I probably wouldn't be doing what I do today and wouldn't be what I am today if it wasn't for Prelude. Uh, Prelude was the label on where I would find the releases the most inspiring when they would come out. In the late 70s, early 80s, I was buying those releases and looking at the labels and seeing the name Francois Kevorkian on there, uh, thinking, oh, this is a French guy remixing stuff in New York. Uh, and, and I love the way he does that. And uh, I wanna, I just wanna do the same. I wanna become a remixer, and that that happened when when I listened to things like D Train or the one for me, and uh, it really inspired me to start, you know, editing and then uh, getting gigs as a remixer and eventually DJing. So it is the utmost important label for me in in my entire life. I'll be as bold as to say this. So picking one record, it's extremely difficult, but because it's the game and I will play it, I will I will pick one. I would probably choose Michael Wilson, Groove It To Your Body, because that's probably where the instrumental mix is, is the one that has probably the biggest input as a remixer from Francois K. And um, it is extremely inspiring it's it's like a master class in remixing there's a lot of things i i uh i nicked 
uh, as tricks and effects from there. And uh, it happens to be one of the rarer Prelude ones, so it's a cool one to, to have as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say Michael Wilson, Prove It To Your Body, uh, mostly the instrumental mix by Francois. Since Dimitri has kind of manifested a certain amount of interest towards this record, I guess I could probably give a few details on how some of it was done. So the console at Eris Studios where this was mixed was one of those beautiful Harrison inline and the thing that characterizes the Harrison console is it has a very sharp EQ so with the clavinet track what I decided to do is uh, I decided to improvise improvise and make like sort of a on the spot wah wah pedal by using the EQ at the sharpest setting meaning narrow bandwidth and changing the frequency, sort of like something like this with the filter. And then, because I was out of tracks on the multi-track, I had to keep doing that by hand while I was mixing and cutting the, the parts on and off. And it was like a marathon. And to be able to last the whole song and doing the wah wah, -wah effect on the track was kind of like, you know, I mean, maybe good exercise for my hand, but otherwise a little bit difficult. But I kind of managed to make enough pieces that I could put the song together and wah wah wah. <laughs> Now here's something special for you. I decided to uh, dig out a different version of this from the archives. Something that never came out actually. So, 
If you can picture me at the console, jiggling the button, doing the wah-wah effect on the clavinet during the whole track, and then with the other hand trying to move things in and out and mute stuff, then that's how the session went, okay? I don't think I've quite ever gotten that much exercise during a mix before or since. now let's talk about prelude a little bit more not to change the topic but the thing that I didn't mention yet about prelude was the people at the top And uh, there was a partnership that was made between Stan Hoffman and Marvin Schlachter. I think they also had some uh, investors and silent partners of some kind, but I've never found out about who was involved in that. But for all intents and purposes, Stan Hoffman was kind of like the radio promotion arm of Prelude that was really taking care of the heavyweight convincing certain radios to play their records and Marvin was the um, stellar company president who signed all of the big acts had an amazing track record he used to be working for GRT Records and Janus Records and he worked with Florence Greenberg at Scepter Records. And I also saw his name associated with some things dealing with Funkadelic and Westbound Records. So Marvin Schlachter was very experienced. And just so that it's totally clear, he is responsible for signing all the big artists that went to preludes such as D-Train and Franz Jolie and Sharon Red and so many others. Uh, as for my contributions as a &R, I was just signing the weird records like Martin Circus and Powerline and The Strikers and a couple other things like that, Rod. But Marvin Schlachter was really the one responsible for an absolutely amazing streak of a &R successes for the company. And I think it should be acknowledged that those were really all acts that he signed. Um, he had an amazing instinctual approach for music. I'm going to tell you more stories about that in a bit, because after all, maybe some of you might want to know, how did I get to work with Prelude, right? Well, stay tuned. We're going to get to that.
Hello everyone, Dave Morales here. One of my favorite Prelude records is Caught Up in a One Night Love Affair, In a Life featuring Jocelyn Brown. The record came out in 1979. I was 17 years old. Most likely, I probably bought the record in Downtown Records. I was 17. I didn't even know who Jocelyn Brown was. All I knew was In a Life. Lord knows, here I come many years later to understand it was Jocelyn Brown. Um, but what can I say? I still love the record. It's still one of my favorite records. Forget about this on Prelude, but great that it's on Prelude and we're here doing a Prelude tribute. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of my favorites. Caught up in a one-night love affair in a life featuring Jocelyn Brown.
and another stellar choice by David Morales acknowledging the true greatness of being able to put together the astonishing voice of Jocelyn Brown with the genius of Patrick Adams' arrangement and craft. And let's not forget John Morales on the mixed duties, okay? This is an all-star affair right here. So just for that, let's stay in Patrick Adams territory right here. After all, it's only fitting that we celebrate and honor those those very very few blessed people who have the talent to change our lives with the music they create and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that the music of Patrick Adams has lifted so many souls. And given so much inspiration to budding music makers. And uh, for me, that it very much includes this singular style of portamento playing that Patrick perfected on the mini moog where he would make the instrument talk instead of hearing a little synthesizer I think we really heard discourse some real pleasant musical speech and that for me will some be something that I always associate with Patrick's Synthesizer playing style. It's so expressive.
one thing a lot of people might not know about. I think Patrick was also surrounding himself with a crack team of musicians, like guitar player Stan Lucas, and I think his lifelong friend Kenny Morris, and a number of others that were really, really talented and sort of helped his sound gel together as a band, as a recording unit. Small detail for the geeks. Because I assume there are geeks in the stream, right? Come on, geeks. If you're in there, holler up. This record, which I mixed also at the same Eras Studios, From what I can remember, it's the first record where I ever triggered a sound electronically with something else. And this was done with a, a thing called the, the clap trap. 
Uh, no, it's not something to catch syphilis. The claptrap was an instrument that you sent a signal to, like a snare drum, and it outputs some clap sounds, which it does on the record. So these claps you hear, they're really electronically generated, and we did it during the mix. So there, that was the geeky detail for you, all right? Greetings, Francois, World of Echoes, um, and whoever's out there. We were tasked with picking a favorite record from the Prelude catalog. Um, it was a tough one, there's many favorites. Um, mine, and I think simply because I've been playing it, or I guess up until the lockdown, I've been playing it quite a bit. Um, it's a record called Dying to Be Dancing by Empress, which took on a whole new meaning, meaning um, after we stopped being able to congregate. Um, what I like about it, it's that I, I think not a lot of people pay attention to the opening hours. Usually, I think just people were used to kind of coming in for peak time of the club or peak time of the party. and. Dying to be Dancing is not one of those records. It is one of those that I like to play early, but as a sort of a bridge to like a more um, sort of high energy state. Um, and Dying to be Dancing really accomplishes that for me. And also, obviously, I'm Dying to be Dancing, so. Um, there is no credit to Francois here. Um, I actually don't know if it proceeds you, um, but it is written um, by Crown Heights, Crown Heights Affair, so and sung by Gil, Gil Smith. So yeah, that's my house. Yes. <clears throat> Yet another record I mixed at Eris Recording Studios with no help from the staff. But for the most part, I think they turned out sort of okay. I was never happy with the sound of these compared to what I could get when I was working with the uh, engineers at Sigma or at Right Track or other places. Because in those days, the thing that's important to remember is that the engineers were not freelance, they were really staff at the studios. talk about a monster bass line which I believe is also played by Unlimited Touches Sandy Anderson and the Reed Anderson machine producing yet another firecracker hit
and another one from the ever reliable Willie Lester and Rodney Brown production team. This one from Gail Adams, which I remember having a lot of fun mixing. This was a big, big skating record for sure, and the thing you can hear in the production is that as soon as D-Train and Kashif arrived on the scene with that sort of synthesizer synthesizer synth bass and synthesizer kind of you know hook driven melodies and it really kind of changed R&B radio immediately overnight and this sound is very much reflecting that I would say production wise it sounds very close to Evelyn King I'm in love or something like that you know I do remember this sounding exceptionally good at the garage. There was something about the bass that just like made the speakers sound just right. Burning up.
My mom's a teacher, she's the best. I bet your mom couldn't pass her test. Your mama's something, you think she's fine. But my mama leaves her far behind. She's everything, yours can't compete. When it comes to looks, she can't be. Your mama's pretty, but mine's a star. She's number one, the best by far. She's the hippest thing in all the world. She's my number one and only girl. So every mama's number one. Remember that when you're making fun. You've got yours, and I've got mine. And a mother's love's one thing you can't buy. I guess that's all. Now the truth is out. Really? That moms are what it's all about. Tell the She's truth. always been a superstar. The only person you can't be sure of. Your mama. mama. Francois C. Gilles. Stiles, how are you? I'm in Your mama. my basement in North London. And delighted we're doing a prelude special and delighted to be asked to pick a track for you. And this is one I've come up with. It's, you know, the thing about Prelude, right, is that Preludes, when you were what I was back in 1980, just beginning, just getting out of the house, getting my first little gigs here and there. And I used to play in a club in Croydon. Um, my mum didn't know I was going to this club because it was uh, it finished at midnight, and uh, I used to tell her that, <laughs> that Croydon was like about half an hour bus ride from where I lived in South London, and I used to tell my mum I was visiting friends, and uh, but I'd actually be going to Croydon to play in a gay club, and um, that club was very much high energy music. And the thing about Prelude is that Prelude was a label that worked with all audiences somehow and so you know you had the tracks like D Train and Sharon Red and Conquest Unlimited Touch all those bands you could play them at both all sorts of scenes they were just huge funky but life-affirming music and um, yeah so it made up very much a sort of base of my record collection as I was like going out the house and doing these early gigs and there's one record that I wanted to sort of just focus in on here because this is a record that was slightly off the beaten track that I always played probably as well because I was just beginning my pirate radio career so I was already doing little radio gigs and there was a group called LAX and I was like seduced by them because of the name of it and realizing it was the name of Los Angeles International Airport which I'd never been to but I was sort of dreaming of going to America then and they already had a big hit a big track called All My Love that was sort of up there getting played but I got the album on import and uh, it's such an early record for me that I've actually got a sticker on it when I used to stick all my records and just make sure that they were referenced to me so it's 2L um, so it was probably my second record on the L section <laughs> of my record collection and anyway on this album there was a track on it called Possessed that was the second track this is a quite a short album three tracks besides I extended EP in a way and anyway um, on this album there was a track called Possessed and this track blew my mind and not only did it blow my mind because it was just great and uplifting and all those things but also because it had a really fantastic arrangement it built up beautifully but it had the first proper jazz piano solo on a sort of disco record and or it felt like that to me and in a way it was a piano solo that would later in a way be repeated by Rose Royce on the track Still In Love but yes the piano solo by Jeff Lee I believe is amazing the track is possessed the build is incredible and the mix is Francois K known at the time as just Francois so voila that's, that's my choice Possessed by LAX and uh, play the album version because it starts off better it's got a build it doesn't go straight into the beat if you may thank you
actually, now that I come to think of it, this was the only time I ever worked at Alpha International Studios in Philadelphia with Gene Leone. It's a great session. Gonna get, gonna get over you, over you. I remember getting some blisters on my hands, holding some wood blocks to re. We did some hand clap overdubs because I, I wanted to get a little more meaty backbeat. So, you know, in the old days, I guess, when people were recording claps, there was a little bit of a cheating trick where you would take two pieces of wood and two or three people in the group would have the wood and it would help thicken the sound of the claps. Of course, clumsy guys like me would hit myself with the wood on the side of the palms and yeah blisters and sue but it's all for a good cause right music 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 denying in the light I can rise and prelude was on fire I just got to they managed to snatch this boy Jarvis Timmy registered collaboration with visual and it became a street anthem of sorts Also of note is that a young DJ by the name of Tony Humphreys was hired to do the mix on this record. The magic of the music, a feeling takes control of me. It's got me moving. It's so long. And I think people are forgetting how important the connection between the radio play, especially for those midday mix shows, the connection between the audiences at the clubs and, you know, radio stations and artists getting their due by being featured on these very popular mix shows like the ones that Chet Pettibone used to have or Tony Humphreys or Timmy Registered or Marilyn Bob and you know at least when it comes to New York City this really was part of the fabric of our culture people were looking forward to those either the lunch hour mix shows or on the weekends they also had big Friday and Saturday night party shows and a lot of us DJs were asked sometimes to submit mixes for those for the evening ones 
But what was really cool about that is that through the mix shows on the radio, some of these very talented, you know, DJs became producers. I guess the best example of that is um, Chef Pettibone, who started a series of albums on Prelude called the Kiss Master Mixes where he would take versions that were pretty much finished all the things that we had mixed and he would just add a couple of overdubs and do some edits and some tricks and really rearrange the stuff around to give it more of an intense feel somewhat similar to what he was doing to play it on the radio but those became really really popular but more importantly I think it gave these DJs a conduit to get themselves into the studio and start producing and mixing and all that so that was like it's almost like a, a farm system you know in the baseball hierarchy I guess before you make it to the major leagues you gotta work your way up and you know I think this was truly marvelous because it allowed for a lot of people get their break and they've all managed to become very very successful in their you know careers I'm not sure there really is anything equivalent to that today
What's happening, y'all? This is Dang Funk, and we're tuned in right now to a song that I really dig a lot. It's called All I Need Is You from Starshine, and the remixer of this was the incredible Francois Kevorkian. Wow, this is a great track. Great bass line, great chords, beautiful melodic vibes, and also it's in the vein of funk like Slave and Aura. It was produced by M-Trax, and it's an East Coast thing, but definitely a prelude East Coast thing where it still has that funk and that boogie vibe mixed in. So again, thank you for all the great remixes on Prelude Records, Francois, we appreciate you, brother. Let's get into this. We love you, brother. Prelude Records, Starshine, all I need is you. Dang funk for you, peace.
And the jams keep coming. Like I'm just looking at the list and it's like, whoa. There's so many more things I gotta get to. It's like unreal.
Francois, and for all the uh, great times we had just uh, making hits back from as far back as the 80s, and, and see, growing up in the 70s and 80s in New York City, uh, I played in bands, and bands, the goal of a band was to play good enough for people to dance to. You would get uh, invited to parties, you would play, you get paid, of course, and uh you know, and then ultimately we started hearing music on the radio that we wanted to get on the radio. How do you do that? We ended up playing and getting produced. And, and so I Hear Music in the Street came out for Unlimited Touch. That was our first hit. And it was a, it was a great hit. And next thing you know, when Searching to Find the One came out, Francois wanted to go in the studio and remix the song. And I said, well, I want to go back in with you and play some additional keyboard parts. And so as we did that, no sequencers were involved, only some effects and what have you. Um, it was a great experience. And since then, Francois and I and a lot of his staff afterwards at Axis, uh, Yvonne Turner, Alan Friedman, a whole bunch of other people, we got together and we just had a ball just taking other people's tunes and adding stuff to it and, and making it pop. And the, the radio stations at the time were listening to what was happening in the clubs. So if you could get a song that made it in the clubs where people would hear it and start jamming, you know, they would, uh, <laughs> they would enjoy that. And next thing you know, it would make it to the radio. And one thing led to another. Session work would happen where regular songs were then remade, remixed, to make it jump in the clubs. And that was a great time of year. It was a great time in life to be a part of. And I'm so grateful. Yeah, very insightful commentary by Lenny Underwood, who, by the way, is playing these keyboards that you just heard him do a little bit of live. I just can't get enough of this now. The story goes that after we managed to sign the Strikers to Prelude, I decided to ask Larry Levant to join me in the studio to do a remix of it because he had been wearing out the original mix for so long on Cesare Records. So when we went in at Right Track Studio to do the mix, we kind of decided to add a couple of new elements to make the thing a little bit fresher and so we asked Lenny Underwood to come in and he did that nice clavinet like riff as well as the hi-hats and he also did all these beautiful pads that show up on the instrumental later 
can't get enough of that funky stuff, really. Get, get. 
This record was a bit of a party mover record, you know, just a bit. There are a few people shaking their booties to this. I mean, yeah. Anyway, this bit is also somewhat of an exclusive because it's a version that I made that never really came out. It was just a rough mix I did an hour, just for fun. And of course, it got bootlegged by bad people who stole tapes from the booth or from Dave Mancuso's ass tape. It's amazing sometimes how greedy people get when they want something, you know? So, yeah, I think... Besides New York, I'm actually hearing that this record was a real big deal in Chicago. That a lot of the house DJs are... For that, we're all jamming this like hard. Like it's one of those hardcore party records that people remember. And in New York, I don't think they ever stopped playing it. That was always a big staple of the peak time part of the nights in some clubs, you know. What's really interesting about this record is that it was really a very cheesy French band that called Martin Circus that mostly did rock music. And they just happened to hook up with this very, very clever producer called Gilles Tiner. And they recorded this as like a one-off with different musicians actually they may just have given their voices and that's it but 
the song was not written by the band. It was written by this guy, Gilles Kinnair. And um, they were actually surprised that it had any success at all in the clubs, and it actually became a classic. So as many other records of that time period, sometimes it really is a matter of it's almost a fluke, you know? And here we go. That's the part they were waiting for. Doom, doom, doom. Let's go. Weebo. Clear the floor. Spread that baby powder. I just have such vivid memories of people having conniptions dancing to this at the law. Hi, this is Ron Trent, and my choice from the Prelude catalog is probably something off the beaten path, which is called Summer Love Thing by Music. Of course, everybody's familiar with, you know, Push Push in the Bush, but this is one of the songs off that album that really touched me. It got introduced to me by my cousin that passed away uh, in, the, in the mid-80s, as a matter of fact, after hearing Ron Hardy play it. And uh, since then, it's always been a classic tune that, uh, you know, I keep in my repertoire. Uh, super bad jam. If you don't know about it, check it out. Prelude is a bad label, and Francois is a bad man. Respect. Yeah. Big up to you, Ron Trent. For such impeccable taste. Because this jam right here is like an orchestral fiesta. It is so gorgeous. Such an amazing Patrick Adams piece.
this one was a little bit more of a sleeper. But for some reason, the people who love this song are actually real passionate about it. In the Middle by Unlimited Touch. And it's all about this verse right here, right here. The way you groove me, the way you turn That is so nasty right here. And again, to do, to Sandy Anderson bass line, what can I say? Whoa. One thing I'd like to really make sure is to acknowledge how deeply indebted we all are to this group of people who actually took it upon themselves to spend all their time making such beautiful messages for this show. So in no particular order, I'd like to acknowledge Dave Lee, Colleen Cosmo Murphy, Paul Raphael, Danny Crivet, DJ Spina, Louis Vega. DJ Harvey, Dimitri from Paris, Charles Peterson, Ron Trent, David Morales, Lenny Underwood. Yvonne Turner Barbie Burtish and Dame Funk What can I say? You made this program so special Your insightful picks and these amazing little bits of commentary you gave us That was such a blessing, so thanks so very much indeed. It's so appreciated.
There is a song for all of 
eso. song right here is really really underrated I think in terms of message and delivery and lyricism it, it really is so timeless. You take a different side to me. Yeah. I mean, just listen to these words.
for a funny story. So here we are, we're sitting in the studio at Sigma Studio 5. I can't dance without you. And I have Jocelyn Brown, Christine Wilshire, and I forget who the third person was doing background vocals for this session with the producer who's in from France. And the girls are like working really hard and obviously as you can hear they're doing amazing vocal work. So at some point we're going to say well we're going to take a break we're going to like order from the deli and the French producer is like not used to treating the musicians to like food or something so He's sort of expecting them to uh, pay for their own thing. And the girls go, well, we don't have money, so I don't know. How are you expecting us to keep working if we can't get food, you know? Just a funny moment. He had to pay the bill. It was all right. It all worked out. Not a thing without you.
and that's of course the incredible voice of Miss Sharon Red, who was in fact extremely popular in the gay clubs where they f treated her like a real queen. And speaking of which, Prelude sound really was all over the place and they managed to snatch quite a few really important records such as this one by a very young I think she was 15 years old when she sang this artist from Montreal named France Jolie and I promise to you this became an amazing, not just gay club anthem, but in 1979 it was right at the proper moment and it became a pop hit. And Prelude actually got themselves on the pop charts with this. was definite like Studio 54 music you know crossover in a major way
this one. One of the more obscure prelude releases. And one reason for that is because they only released it through a licensee in Canada. This didn't even get a U.S. release. It was a project called Center Stage. And it really was the brainchild of Christine Wilshire, not just as a vocalist, but as a producer as well. I always thought it was very underrated, really great song.
That was okay. But this right here coming up, that's the part we used to live for. Right here.
Okay, we're going to take a little bit of a breather right here for a second. Let's just decompress a bit. And we're going to hear one of the most unusual prelude records ever released. Go calmly amid the noise and the haste And remember what peace there may be in silence As far as possible, without surrender Be on good terms with all persons Speak your truth quietly and clearly And listen to others Even to the dull and the ignorant They too have their story Avoid loud and aggressive persons. They are vexatious to the spirit. If you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble. It is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself. Especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love. For in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune, but do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. And whatever your labors and aspirations, 
in the noisy confusion of life, keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy.
really gorgeous. Look what you have gone and done. Sort of mellow, jazzy ballad. It was actually produced by a really interesting gentleman. His name was Giuliano Salerni. And I thought the whole album he produced for this act, High Gloss, was really great quality stuff. You have just yourself to blame. A fool's a fool by any other name. You never know, you never know. You never know, you never know. You never know how close we amazing when you think about how much music was in the Prelude catalog, right? Anyway, this was a truly memorable event. Even though I didn't get to talk about a lot more things that I think I should have mentioned. But isn't that always the case? No matter how much you accomplish, no matter how many things you get done, 
Well, we can always choose to look at what part of the bottle is full or what part is empty, right? So in that spirit, I think this has been an absolutely incredible session, really wonderful, the history books. And I can only reiterate my incredible appreciation for all those who contributed to it and who helped make it so very, very touching and special, as well as all those of you who have hung around for the stream's duration, which is almost seven hours. Wow. I am not only humbled, but truly, I don't know, I can't express how beautiful that makes me feel in a way that we're able to share all of this so sweetly. So, here's lo looking forward to many more such musical adventures together. Hopefully, there's so much beautiful music out there. It's kind of a shame for us not to experience all of that together, you know? Anyway, once again, Don't you know I love you? And I want they're you saying it better than I can. I'm gonna show Thank you for all the love. Let us begin. 
this is also a very, very sweet song.
Then I thought, what? We haven't even played Rod, the man with the most cryptic lyrics on this side or any side of any ocean. I I think we have to rectify this mistake.
And if someone knows what he's saying, please let us know, all right? I got the part where he says on the telephone. Yeah, you know I'm not in the house. 
Boys and girls, 
That's the very magic of D Train. This idea of to combine a real classy, soulful vocals with a strong, beautiful message with absolutely stunning electronics and very, very well-defined synthetic textures. And when this stuff came out, it was remarkable because in some way I feel that it kind of helped change the sound of popular music between D-Train and Kashif. They completely revolutionized a lot about soul music. They kind of put it into the 20th, late 20th century. And that is why it still sounds so relevant today because this, in some form, was probably the template for things that we're still experiencing today. They were one of the first. Something else that few people are conscious of. In the later years of the label's existence, Prelude actually, on the heel of their success, started a bit of an acquisition binge. Mainly, they decided to acquire the assets of a very famous label called Savoy Records that obviously had a massive catalog of gospel music and they kind of moved their operation to New Jersey where this was originally based and this is one of the last releases I think that was kind of a Savoy oriented gospel track that came out on Prelude, if I'm not mistaken. And 
I believe this group, the New Jersey Mass Choir, are also responsible for one song remake that was pretty popular for a bit during the mid-80s. I think they did a rendition, a remake of the Foreigner song, I Want to Know What Love Is. They actually have gotten into the pop charts. enough to send you peacefully into the night once again thank you so much a remarkable seven hour stretch